energy, we need them. We only have a few. Uh, it could be any number of ways that young people have power. Or we even can play, they can play power, or it can, we can give them power by saying, I want to be like them. You know, I'm not young anymore. I wish I were, and we defer in a healthy way, even. Uh, my belief on that, just to take a quick tangent, is we have to be true to the age we are, and we have to be honest about who we are and who we are at a certain age. Otherwise, we're silly. And, and people take us as sad. They feel sorry for us, but we don't know who we are at a certain age. I mean, you, you could look at me and guess how old I am, and that's undeniable. We can do what we can to do the best, but it, you know, it is what it is. And the reality is, as a teacher today, I am perceived as a father figure. I am not an older brother. Nobody has an older brother at college as old as I am. So I am a father figure. Or I might be bordering on the grandfather figure, depending on the who their family is and how their families worked out. I could be a grandfather figure. And I realized that in the next few years, I will be really making that transition. In five years, I will be as much grandfather as father. But if I don't know that, then I, I become a silly person. And I'm not taken seriously. So power of youth. Our culture values youth. We are afraid to be older. Um, all those kind of things. We are afraid to lose younger people. So the power of youth is very significant. And it's, it's significant more in some places than others. What about the power of education? How do we see that played out in the church and in the music ministry? Not nearly really as much as it used to be. That is exactly right. We can't play the education card so much anymore because people don't care. It doesn't have the power it wants to. But it has more power in some places than it does in others. And we tend to, in churches, we tend to be while we tend to migrate toward enclaves of like-minded people. And so in places where the education thing piece is big, it does tend to stay pretty big. And if we don't find the power we want to find in certain places, we tend to migrate toward other places where the power structures that we understand and we value are valued. Which I believe is one of the main reasons that churches are divided, are Churches, people decide on churches the way they do. I think they decide them because they weigh their power often against the power of others and they decide, you know, I couldn't be powerful in this place, so I'm not going to join this church. People are too smart for me. They, they speak a different language. They speak um, white collar language or they speak blue collar language. And we better believe those are different languages. Yeah. And, yeah, we, that's as cross cultural as it is to be serving in another country, I think. I only figured out a couple years ago, I had a student serving in a community outside Waco, and the student just kept hitting the wall everywhere. And I, I would say, well, here's what they're thinking. Here's what these people are thinking. And he would say, well, how was I supposed to know that? And, you know, I know that because I am a, a, from a blue-collar family. I mean, I totally understand that world. But he, had, he might as well have been serving in Hong Kong. I think he would have been more connected in a larger city in another country than he was connected in a city five miles away. So that's a huge thing, the power of education. But the words, the way we use words, we say words that people understand, and we intimidate people by our words. How does that happen in a choir person? How might that happen in a choir rehearsal? That people don't understand. And we, do, we, we might do that. And some of us grew up in a time where we were taught to do that. Use the language, let the people rise to your level. Well, I don't believe that. I think we can, use the, we can say the language that people can understand. Or we can say, musicians might call this whatever, but here's what it is. We might use both and interpret as we might in a cross-cultural setting. Because music, a choral rehearsal, is a cross-cultural setting. There are many languages being spoken, and we must be interpreting what we're saying. Otherwise, we're intimidating people, and that is not a Christ thing, as I see. Okay, and we, so we use all of that. 
I was in a church once where every time people spoke in a business meeting, they came with prepared statements. And they read from what they had written. So what kind of congregation is that? It's quite nice because people had thought out their stuff and they weren't reacting in the emotional thing. But what about the, the people who were, who did think in the moment? They did speak because they were the power was greater than the earth. The power is not even. It's not free flowing. The power is social thinking. How might that look in the community? He's the whatever. She is the something at bay in this community. You know? That's right. He whatever, which says all kinds of things. So we have all the social standing things. Somehow, some people's personality types will overwhelm other groups. Exactly. So all kinds of power. Power of position. In some cultures, that's much more important than it is in others. If you travel in some cross-cultural settings, power of position is huge, and you're introduced by what your titles are. In other places, you know, your titles mean nothing. It's interesting that titles, I think, are coming back into vogue as meaning something. Every student that I get an email from at Baylor who is kind of on the, on the tour side of things says, you know, Stephen Carroll, um, director of the whatever, member of the something, president of the this, and they have all these all these tags on their emails. And it wasn't just five years ago that you wouldn't find a tag on any student email. So students all over the place are into what am I doing and who am I? Very interesting little phenomenon. I don't know what it means and what it's saying and if it needs some kind of shift that's happening in a huge way. Financial power. How are financial powers present in the church? <laughs> yeah, we all know that. Right? Yeah. We, it means something different sometimes when one person tells you, I'd like us to sing this song sometimes, and another person says it. Maybe it should. But if, if, if you believe it doesn't, then you're pretty stupid. But you have to know it, and you have to weigh it against other problems. And the way that I think that we do that is we hear all this information, but we also listen to the person who might be perceived as powerless, and we also work to make that person's voice heard, and then that balances the power. Yeah. Uh, power of pragmatism, the financial power, we talked about that. Uh, power of pragmatism. This is something that I've kind of recently kind of stumbled onto. Today. But what's the power of pragmatism? How might that be present? Okay. All right. We'd like to do this, but you know, we've got to keep the on. We've got to do all this pragmatism. How might it also work in a worship minor session? That's right. It works. It'll accomplish the task. And this would be harder than this works where I know how to do this. Or we already have the music for this. Or so and so did this, whatever. So all these kind of pragmatic things where we, in, in a sense, take the power, we take the easy way, or the pragmatism. And some churches, the pragmatic, they will draw a crowd. That's what the people would want. Whatever. Doesn't mean that's bad, it just means it is powerful. And it's a power of the sweat movements. Uh, the power of mass appeal. What might that be? Why? Okay, we all know. That's what the people want. That's what they will respond to. When we did that before, they responded well. Therefore, this mass appeal thing. Do you realize that these things are not bad? And when we when we label them all as bad, then then what are we going to do? We're just going to say, well, it's all bad and what am I going to do? Well, it is reality. Reality is open for interpretation. It's something we need to know, but we have to know how to do that. I want to mention one more that came up in the session yesterday, and that was the power of space. It came up in, in our session yesterday. But what about the power of space? What does your room say? What does your church say? What does your dwelling, the, the, the location where you worship, what does it say? And we talked yesterday in the session, what does this room say? The first thing he said, the most obvious thing are the pipes. 
And then I said, so when you think about pipes, and what is that message does that say? And we said, well, we are not poor. And there's no way that you can say we are poor and you can have this room to worship it. And frankly, sometimes I say that about Baylor. I say, Baylor is in every conceivable way a wealthy place. Everything about this place says we are not poor. So when we do something at Baylor, I tell our staff, just, uh, frankly, I said, we, we can't do it on the, on the um, cheap. Because people will say, you have the money, you should choose to spend it on me. Even if that's not true, and if the money were not in my, I didn't have access to it. It still says that. But a room speaks volumes. People walk into a room and they know. They walk into your church, they drive up to your church, they observe it from a distance, and they know. And so we need to think about that. We need to, and the thinking about it is not an easy thing. It's not easy to say, how will we be welcoming to certain people in this place? Would this place even allow us the opportunity to welcome people here? Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, that might, but, but we've always done it that way, therefore we must, that we have this expectation. The power of tradition is huge. How long does it take to build a tradition? Okay, two weeks. Yeah, in some places. I always say in a college community, uh, it's two years. If you do it once, and then you do it the next year, the third year, we always do it this way. <laughs> and, and students are very tradition oriented. You know, they, they will fight for tradition more than older people, actually. Uh, interesting, interesting stuff. They wouldn't, they wouldn't like that to be true, um, but it is true, whether you like it to be or not. All right, let's look at some things, some observations about power in the church. And then again, this is big picture power stuff. But I read this, um, this a, a big part of the book this summer about power. I wanted to share just a few little bullet points of that. The church cannot afford to be casual or complacent about something that's formative to its life, which is power. Power is present whether we acknowledge it or not. And we've said that. But you must be aware of it. A healthy churches must be vigilant to analyze power. When much is happening, the potential for power abuse is high. Um, and the interesting point there is that the potential for power abuse is greater the more active the congregation. That's the point that I had never thought about before. Which for many music ministry, um, if you're in a church where there's a bunch of things going on, the potential for abuse is greater. Why? Those people, what do you think? 
what is your perspective? I learned a few years ago that sometimes God is most visible in the people that are most on the margins. And I don't mean the margins, meaning on the edges, but people who might be perceived as nearly powerless in an organization. They may offer you the most wisdom, and God may be most present in those people. And we must protect those people who don't fit, that don't fit the norm. I would say in a choir organization, just as an example, a lot of my microcosm of life is the Leto Men's Choir, which has about 100 guys. And that's sort of a way that I imagine life a lot. But I try to be very sure that the guys on the edges are feeling included. The guys who are pushing the envelope in different ways. If those people feel included, what, what are the middle, what's the middle ground people? Well, if the, if the people that are pushing are included, the middle people are going to be well within that circle. Okay. So I can value the person who doesn't sing as well, the person who isn't making good grades, the person who isn't leading well, the person who's making some different, some alternative life choices, the person who whatever. Then the people in the middle are going to feel safe and care about it. So I think we often need, as leaders, to listen to, to the perceived powerless. If we don't do that, sometimes those groups band together and then there's all kinds of power struggles that we deal with. And it happens all the time in churches and people are not listened to. Uh, churches have all, always have certain levels of inequality, and these may be subtle and hard to recognize from the, from the inside. They may be intentional or not. Churches have lots of levels of inequality, and you know, if you think about it, that your church has those. But the more you're in an organization, the less you see the inequalities. Because the more you are a part of them. We don't intend to be a part of them, maybe on the outset, but, they, but we are when we're there a lot of a period of time. What might be an example? Perceive that how someone looks and how they dress. We're going to talk about that in a session later this afternoon about all we are is a part of worship leadership. We can actually talk about dress a bit, but that might be something. How we look at people, how we don't look at them, how we subtly address people. There are all kinds of levels of inequality where you know you're in the club or you're not, and you know where the power is and you're not a part of that. When you're newcomers, we see that in a great big way. Not so much as staff people, but when you're a member, how many of us have been a part of some organization lately that we had, in which we had no perceived power? It's really healthy to do that. But do you realize that some of you cannot go to any place and not have some level of power? Because of who you are and because of how you are perceived and even because of your persona. I'll be being um, a, a bit uh, vulnerable here. A couple of years ago, um, several years ago, I started going to some regular counseling sessions because I was trying to figure out more of who I am and the bigger scheme of things and how do I relate and keep myself from getting beat up all the time and different things like that. And one of the things that I was told was that you probably don't have the ability to go into a, an organization for very long and not um, and be perceived as neutral. Because if you say something, you're going to not be neutral. And if you don't say anything, you're going to not be neutral. So you can't simply show up and be quiet because your silence speaks so loudly. And if you say anything, your voice is going to speak loudly. So if you know that, then you can at least be diligent. But you cannot be neutral. Now, we, I would suggest that all of us are probably that person in some places, and at least in our church. And that wasn't meaning every place in the world, and, and the places that I run around, in, like around here. But I, that was really, really, really telling for me because that way I didn't. I, I began to 
understand. But when I go to the meeting and I decide ahead of time, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Well, that was not being helpful either. See? And that was perceived as what we always had something to say. So, yeah. You see power? See why I think this is important? It's really a big deal. And it's a lot to carry sometimes. But if you have a choice of carrying it, no, you do not. But to not know it is indeed a problem. The power, uh, the powerful do not always get their way. Elected leaders do not necessarily possess power. Anyone can help create a community and anyone can help destroy it. It's really important. Um, a long time ago, I was in a church as a college student, and I had been an advocate for a change in the budget. Uh, that would accommodate music and youth. I was a combination minister at the time. And everybody on the committee agreed to the change, and everybody said, oh, this will be great, this will be just fine. But we came down to the vote, but we didn't have this extension it's like the church is about budget. This was a small church. Came down to the vote. Some people that I had never seen before came to the business meeting. A man stood who was very much in my perception on the periphery of our congregation. And he spoke against the budget shift. And the church voted by a great majority to not support the budget change. And I learned a lot about power that night. I learned that the people on the committee did not have any power. And that man had a lot of power. And these people perceived that he is our neighbor and he is going to be our neighbor. And he runs our lives one way or the other. Uh, we were in the game, as I said, so. And he grew into that, he and some others. And I learned a lot about power that night. And I learned that just because people tell you this is okay, does it mean that they have the ability? And elected officials, they have nearly, they I mean, have almost no power. And in that situation, I think it was a more fear thing than a respect thing. I think it was after I, I mean, I was in touch with that community through my life because my life was from that community. And I think it was maybe more fear driven than it was actually respect driven. But power is so huge and it controls so many things. So, one of the questions I always tell my students is when you are in a new place, what meet the leaders? And then meet the powerful and learn who is fits in those different places. They may not be the same people. Sometimes they are the same, but oftentimes they're not. But often not. There's an there's a unspoken power as well. Um, honesty, teachability, uh, uh, openness are must haves for genuine community to develop. The leader must assure that these qualities are present. And our role is to, um, to work within all the people that lobby us. In a sense, your, your power is constantly being lobbied. If people are speaking to you to have their power become uh, in place. And we have to absorb all of that, the chaos of those conversations of sorts, and then speak as well as we can to that whole group of people that are lobbying us for power. Does that resonate with some of your lives sometimes? Yeah. And so we have to absorb that and then speak toward it. Indifference within the church to injustice, suffering, and power abuse steals away from it any voice of action for Jesus in the world at large. Because um, Jesus will ultimately stand for the suffering and stand for the stand for the suffering. So when we when our church doesn't speak to that, we are in, in the face of Jesus, I believe, as it were. And it's not going to be wrong in the long, long run. Revisiting the power of music. Uh, just a few quotes here. We must recognize the power that we hold through music. Music has the power to move us emotionally, to deepen us spiritually, enrich us intellectually, and stir us toward missional living. And that's from my book. Uh, but what happens if we don't do these things? Uh, is, is another way to look at it. Martin Luther wrote that whether you wish to comfort the sad, to terrify the happy, 
to the courtesy of the Spirit, to humble the proud, to calm the passionate, or to appease those uh, fully of faith, what more effective means than music could you find? So the power of music. John McClure, who I quoted also yesterday, while all aspects of worship have formative power, none has a more formative influence than music. We all know the power of music, power to move the soul, power to sculpt and chisel our emotions, power to excite our imagination. So we're making a, a loop here now. What about the power of music? Uh, discernment is at the core of power, and John Whitfleet uh, well points this out. Discernment involves taking on the mind of Christ and determining what is best. I underline that statement because I've been, I think a lot about discernment, and I'm very interested and want to be a person who understands discernment better. And so the idea that discernment involves taking on the mind of Christ and determining what is best is, is I think, a helpful statement. It involves knowledge, insight, love, and always the input of the community of faith. So there is no, there is no individual discernment. I don't think discernment ever happens completely individually. It needs to happen within a communal environment. There needs to be other people that speak into that. And not just the people. Anytime we're talking about a communal environment, we're, I believe we're talking about not just the people who agree with us, but do you speak to the people who might not agree and how do you listen to those people? Because we can always find the people that agree. We can always find them. So we like those people. We, you know, we feel good about that because they make us feel good about us. But it's not much of it's not wise, even though it feels really good, and we're all drawn to it. Now, this whole next section is stuff that uh, some set is actually section titles from the book uh, from uh, the recent book that I read. But it speaks a lot about the power of music. The music of which worship has the power to inspire and direct us to God. I think we know that to be true. And I'll just point through this quickly. Music has the power to express creativity and to reflect God's creativity. It's one of the major ways that we express our creativity and that we reflect back the creativity of God that God has then invested in us. So we're simply getting that back. Music has the power uh, to reflect beauty inherently associated with God's creation. Music has the power to help us express ourselves freely and openly. Many of us would be pretty closed people if it weren't for music being our outlet emotionally and even physically. Even physically we're able to express ourselves from music. So who would you be if you weren't able to, music were not an outlet for you? Yeah, I think it's an important question. Uh, music has the power to it that connect us to humans in their various life situations. And I believe that's one of the reasons that we are drawn not just to congregational music, but also many of us to choral music, and because it's the people that we sing with, the people that we collaborate with, that give us this great joy. It is for me. I don't believe there is any, well, you can have choral music without community, but I don't think it's, I would almost go to the level where I would say I don't think it's worth it. Because I think the communal aspect of music is really, at least for me, that's what really makes my life tick. That's huge. Um, and I think that's the way that we bring people into, if we want choral music to be important, we must first establish a safe community. And if we can establish a safe place for people to make music, people will be eager, I think, over time, to step into that safety. When I ask the Baylor Men's Choir every year, what is it that brought you to this place? What's going to bring you back? What do you tell your friends? We have this big town meeting every spring, and we all imagine how this organization could be better and what we do to make it better. They always say, what draws me here is this is a safe place. This is a place where I can come and let my guard down, and I know that I'm not, and I know that people in this place care about me, and they love me. Well, you know, lots of things are much better than that. That's pretty much what we're all seeing. So that's a sacred thing. That is very much a sacred thing. But music has the power to give us a, a vehicle through which that can be connected in all those ways. Uh, music has the power to mark special times and occasions. How many of us could mark our lives without them? 
Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yes, last night we were singing in the Sweet By and By, that arrangement, uh, the healthy arrangement that we read. And I leaned over to the student opposite and I said, This was sung by Grandma Sweet And that was uh, nearly 30 years ago. Yeah. But it was, it marked a moment for me. It took me back to something very, very special. And then I was beautiful. Music has the power to represent all people. One of the ways that I have most learned about the people of the world is by singing. It connects us beyond ourselves. It has the ability to connect us to life in heaven. Most of my imagination of what heaven might be like is really pretty much all connected to music that I've sung. I don't guess that would happen. I'm not really drawn to perfect strings and glitz and that kind of thing, you know, that didn't really even, I don't know if I'll like that. But I'm confident I'm going to like music. It really does connect me there. Music has the power to help us stand in solidarity with worldwide Christians. There's nothing more powerful than singing somebody's song and for them to hear it in some factory. There's nothing more amazing than that. And it connects us in the solidarity that is established. I just got back a few weeks ago with the Leo Mitz Choir and Rob for a trip to Kenya. We took 50 guys in Kenya for two weeks. And the ability for music just to be an instant connection. I mean, we could start singing in a marketplace and we had 150 people just gather just like that. And immediately we, we were singing songs from their culture. They were singing, we were singing. Before you know, we're all dancing, everybody's out there. And, and the connection. And then we would leave, and even when we were there 30 minutes, and, and people wanted us to sing. And music was tangible. I mean, it was, you could. Feel it, you could see it, you know, you didn't just sing it, you, it was more. It was more than that, so much more than that. Uh, music has the power uh, to move beyond self consciousness in order to show our love. I think music would move us to be way outside ourselves in a way that perhaps for many of us, no other art form might do. It has the power to help us worship with our bodies. Uh, our, I don't think movement in music can be really be separate. And um, so I'm trying to become a better bodily embodiment person through music. That's something that, as awkward as it might be sometimes, and as uh, much as you know, I'm not good at it, I still want to be fully embodied through music. I'm able to let music embody. How is it how to express our intimate experiences in our most public ways? What, what art form could express the most intimate experiences, something that you couldn't even know how to talk about, and then something so public and so big and so shared, and to be able to do all of that? Wow, that's power, isn't it? That's tremendous power. Uh, it has the power to express the full gamut of the Christian experience. Even in our little brief worship time yesterday, we had such a wide range of the kinds of ways that we can speak. It has the power to create unity. We can come together around music. And communities, worship communities, do that on Sundays. We come together with expressions. Um, it has the power to give us a voice to offer to God that we couldn't offer privately. How many times have you sung something and you immediately knew that you couldn't have expressed this over God? You couldn't have thought of it. You couldn't have sung it. You couldn't have spoken it. Saying thanks be to God. It has the power to heal. Have any of you been in such pain in your life and music was the one thing that came across to you and brought you to the place of it? Certainly been true in my life. Yeah. So, you know, as we're nodding through this session and saying yes, 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 are we saying, now I must share this with others? Why is it that I'm talk, that I believe in this? Yeah. A few years ago, uh, my wife is an English teacher. And a few years ago, a student raised his hand in her class one day and said, You know, Miss Bradley, I think you really love this stuff. <laughs> and she said, Yeah, I really do. You know, and I just don't think there's a higher compliment that we could be given for somebody to say, you know, I, wow, you really seem to believe this matters. And he's like, well, yeah, absolutely. I do. Yeah. And, and it should come through in who we are. 
it should just ooze from us in a way. I, I love the fact, again, I use the men's choir as an example, but I do several little different things around Baylor, and the men's choir is one of them. But the guys at the men's choir, oftentimes, they think the only thing that I do at Baylor is direct the Baylor men's choir. <laughs> and their perception of me is that's all I do. And every once in a while, one of them will come and say, you know, I saw a lot of you read the book. Oh my gosh, I have no idea. You know, whatever. You know, and they don't think that I do anything except the men's choir. And I don't think there's a higher compliment than that. Because I'm so glad that they believe that is the only thing that makes my life pulse. Is that. I'm glad they think that, and I hope that I could be that kind of person that the different places I stand in, that it would be as if that's the only place that I ever go. Which I think is a, a really nice, uh, odd compliment. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I also tell my students, I, I will choose to take that as a compliment. <laughs> so we can oftentimes cho choose to take it as a compliment or as a visit depending on how we, where we were staying. Uh, has the power to aid in transformation. Wow. Has the power to break down barriers. Music, can just, there's so much historical evidence. Read some uh, evidence, some things in, the, in my book. Uh, there's some examples from the Civil Rights Movement that talk about how everybody was discouraged and how they didn't believe that they could go back out and march one more time. And yet, they started singing in the basement in Birmingham and in a few minutes, they stepped right into the rain March to Selma, and they stepped into the rain and started again. And the music changed them and it lifted them and moved them forward. Yeah. Um, how are music and worship involved in power? Consider these questions. Who determines what songs are sung? Who makes those determinations? And in different faith backgrounds and different denominations, the choices may be made by different people. I believe they should be made in some way communally. Not by votes and that kind of thing, but I think they somehow need to be made in a communal, with a communal input. That can take a lot of forms, but it needs to be communal. And if you don't have voices of minority, and if you don't have people in the room that are suggesting things that you've never thought of, then something is wrong. Okay. And yesterday, the, the song, Oh Great God, Give Us Rest, that we sang in worship. I would like to tell you that I found that song that I did. Somebody else found it and said, oh, this would be a great song for this worship. And I listened to it and I thought, yeah, this is, this is some great stuff. I'd like to tell you off about it, but, you know, I did. So there you go. The best ideas are probably not yours. <laughs> or mine. They're probably mine. <laughs> Actually. Um, who are the power brokers within your country? Who are those people and how do they the power of worship power brokers? And who are those people and how do we come together and negotiate that? What groups within your congregation are less in power? Who are they? And how do you make the point of hearing? What groups are more in power? What groups are powerless? What people feel that they have no voice? Yeah. How do you utilize the power that you have been given as we think about all of this power system? How do you utilize that? What power do you share? It's a good question. Let's, let's talk about that for a second. What power do you share with your music ministry? Well, let's, let's narrow that down a bit. What power do you share within a choral setting? Let's talk about that for a second. Start to actually offer input. 
And sometimes you can't take that publicly, but again, the men's part have often come to me and said, what if we were to do this? And oftentimes, I'm so glad they did because it matters and it helps. But in a music ministry setting, what kinds of things do we share? How much, how much power can we share? And I believe most of the time when we share more, we are then empowered to share even more. And we suddenly start to realize that it's not all about how we think. And actually some people might have thought of it a lot better. Important stuff to think about. Now that, we can talk about delegation. That's a whole other topic. We're not going to go there right now. But how we share. What power do you guard? And why? Okay. Sometimes we guard power, I believe we guard power most often because we're insecure. Okay. And we don't ask someone because we perceive that they will believe that they know more than we do. And we actually may know that they know more than we do. And we want to don't want to ask them because we don't want them to know that we know what they already know. And we might as well just be honest about it. How many times does that work within the company's I've worked with a whole bunch of companies who are a whole lot smarter than I And better musicians. I've learned to receive input from the companies and say, what did you hear in that passage? And just call them out and say, what did you hear? Because when I accompany, and I do accompany in low level settings, um, I hear a lot of things from the piano that I never hear from standing from there's so many more things I've got arms to deal with and the group process and he's not singing and she's too loud. And, I mean, you have so many things to think about. So sometimes another person can hear all kinds of things. But empowering that person. And then if that person handles that power well, then you can continue to work in a collaborative way. If not, then you have to redraw the lines and figure out where those lines are. Very important stuff. Um, how does how does power affect the songs that are sung in the congregation? Which ones do you sing because you know you have to because of who wants them to be sung and who has lobbied for that or not? And you have to balance it. It's not, you're not going to get away from it. So work with it. Call it ministry. Because it is. Who is enlisted to sing and why? Who do you enlist to sing and who do you choose to sing and how obligated are you for those things? Again, it doesn't mean it's bad. Power is power. It isn't bad or good necessarily. It just is. Uh, in what ways does your church staff broker and posture for power, particular power for worship? Who brokers and who speaks and how does it matter? And it, does the pastor always have the last word? Or not? Should the pastor always have the last word? I believe this is no. But you better work with it. If you believe that, you better work with a pastor who trusts you and you allow who believes in a collaborative environment. Yeah. Important things to think about. Uh, what power do you hold that can easily intimidate others? Has anybody ever told you that you're an intimidating person? Okay. We all are intimidated to somebody. Everybody intimidates somebody. So being the intimidation factor is one of the hardest things in the world to handle. Because you don't intimidate yourself. Okay. But to realize who you might intimidate and what that might do. How, how might an outsider view your power within the worship set? One of the telling things for me is to see a small child stand on the pew from Sunday morning and be done. Okay. Who does the child believe has power? You. Yeah. And the truth is, you probably the only person that child will imitate in entire worship. <laughs> so that child believes you have more power than the past. That child could be right. <laughs> and the only person that might not know that might be the past. <laughs> and I don't say that in a bragging way. I just simply say, you better know it. And you better use it well. Um, how does the modern um, worldview value for power for words versus the postmodern worldview suspicion of words affect the power that you hold in your congregation and its future. We'll talk about that in a second, but in a modern worldview, which is not where we're headed, okay, the power of words is everything. 
If you say it right, it is real, it is true, it is accurate, it is exactly, yeah, it's real, true. Now, postmoderns would say words are just words and they carry no more power than anything else. I would tend to probably agree with that for the most part. But the difference in the way that people perceive words are not matters. Now, if words were so powerful, why would our church in a committee meeting a few days ago, three or so ago, why did we spend about 45 minutes editing a three paragraph document? If the, word, the words were powerful, and we still couldn't come to agreement that this word really set the total essence of what we were trying to say. So words are only stats of communication. They attempt at communication. They do not speak accurately. If that were true, why is it that our words are all misperceived? And why is it that we all find ourselves in more trouble today through email than we ever had when we had phone conversations, or even better when we had face-to-face -face conversations? Because words are not representing us well. Okay. So words are only words. They do not carry ultimate power. How might the power of music and the power of words differ from more conservative denominations to those with a broader liturgical and theological power? Do you think more conservative denominations are more word-centered or less word-centered? They conservatives are more word-centered. That's why we have discussions about things like inerrancy and those kind of things. Because it's very much word-centered versus others that are more broadly centered in other communicative styles. Okay, and that's why there's more, one of the reasons why sermons are longer in more conservative churches and not so long in other churches, because words are received as much, much, much more powerful. And that's why preaching has been the end-all, be-all of it is the ultimate experience in more conservative denominations, which will be shifting in my, if you come to my future session later, it will be shifting. I'm convinced it will be shifting. There's no evidence to the contrary. Even though some of us would like to see that be true, it, I, I, you know, whether we want it to be true or not, this is making it or not. Uh, how might a cultural suspicion from the authority give you your power? Power of other worship leaders in the church in general. Uh, people that are very suspicious of power, younger people particularly, how might they view the worship and how might they view the power structures? Very interesting study. It's very interesting to talk to younger people about that. Uh, how might, what steps might you take to distribute your power? Where can you send that forth? And just because you've given away power before and somebody abused it, does not mean that you are now heard and you shall never rise again. It just means you gave it away in the wrong way or whatever. It doesn't mean that you can't do that. But what are the inherent dangers of holding power that you don't know that you have? How does, how does one possess his or her power, um, assess his or her power accurately, and why is it supported? And I wrote several pastors out beside that statement because I think that's the crux of where we're headed today. What are the inherent dangers of holding power that you don't know you have? If you, you can't wear power as a weapon against people or proudly or any of that, but it is just to so be arrogant about power is completely wrong. But to have power and not know it is just as dangerous, if not more dangerous. Okay? Does that, does that connect? So what I will going to believe that somewhere in the line of knowing what power you possess and wearing it lightly and being able and willing to share it appropriately. Now, I'm not even going to say generously. I would just say appropriately. Now some warnings, and then we'll have a moment for a couple of questions. The church's music leaders must be good stewards of the power that, that, that has been invested within them. We must repent of our continual misuse of music's power in many ways. We'll talk about manipulation in another session. Music has been wrongly used within the church and elsewhere, and we must continually repent of the ways that we intentionally or unintentionally misuse music. To live within the world of music leadership is always to be at the risk of misuse. Lots of thoughts that we can go in. Harold Best, uh, whom I have 
a lot of common sense as Christian musicians you must be particularly cautious. They can create the impression that God is more present when music is being made than when it is not. That worship is more possible with music than without it, and that God might possibly depend on his presence before appearing. Okay? So you see the power there. Alright, so these are the warnings. Now this is the be careful spot. Okay, and the last one. Our sensory experiences during worship all take a back seat to what we know, what we believe, the truth of the gospel. It is not our singing, attitude, earnest desire, or orthodoxy that enable us to draw near to God. It is the blood of Jesus Christ shed on behalf of our sins. Magnifying the cross confronts our tendency towards self-righteousness and self-effort. And I thought that was a very good place to shut down and say, save the blood of Christ. You know, we were worthless. We had to be honest as we can be otherwise. And we are fooling ourselves to believe that. Okay, a quick question.